Good morning, everyone. Salamat pagi, Jeeve, as we say in the Irish language. Um, it's a really great pleasure to be here this morning at the 2022 Georgetown Missionary Festival, particularly so as the festival meets in person once again. Indeed, it's always wonderful to be in the beautiful UNESCO World Heritage Site that is Georgetown, Penang. Um, and as a happy coincidence, Ireland's capital city, Dublin, is, as some of you may know, a UNESCO World City of Literature, due in no small part to the many famous writers that have graced our shores, including, of course, Dublin-born James Joyce. We in the Embassy of Ireland in Malaysia are very pleased to help bring to this year's Georgetown Literary Festival, a component on James Joyce's Ulysses, one of the most famous literary masterpieces of all time. Particularly so, as this year marks the centenary of the publication of Ulysses. The book was first published in Paris on Joyce's 40th birthday, the 2nd of February, 1922, by American-born Sylvia Beach of Shakespeare and Company Bookstore. And over the past year, Irish embassies and consulates around the world have been partnering with different cultural institutions and organisations on a rich global programme um, ranging from exhibitions and publications to commissioned artworks, performances and readings. We are delighted to be able to partner with GTLF and I want to express my sincere thanks and appreciation to the wonderful Pauline Fan, curator without whom this collaboration would not have happened, and of course, uh, to express thanks to Swarna, Desmond, and the entire hardworking GTLF team. As you can see on the programme for the festival, there will also be a screening later this afternoon of a one-hour documentary produced in Ireland to mark this 100th anniversary called 100 Years of Ulysses, devised by historian Frank Callanan and directed by Ruan McGann. And it features interviews with a variety of writers and scholars, including to name a few, Eva McBride, Paul Muldoon, John McCourt and Margaret O'Callaghan, and includes an illuminative archive film and photographs, newly commissioned artworks by Jess Tobin, Brian Lawler and Holly Pereira, and an original score by Natasha Pauberg. It seeks to demonstrate how Joyce and Ulysses are being considered anew. And this year, I should add, also marks the 100th anniversary since the establishment of the Irish state, and so the interplay of Joyce's work with this is also explored. Ulysses is truly a global phenomenon which has influenced countless people around the world, I'm sure many of you here in this room, and the fact that Bloomsday is celebrated each year across the globe and that the centenary of the publication has inspired so many events really reflects this. T.S. Eliot just once described Ulysses as the most important expression which the present age has found is the book to which we are all indebted and from which none of us can escape. The theme of this year's GTLF, Taming the Wild, and in particular the question that is posed as part of this on how language and literature negotiate the existential complexities of our human condition, liberate us from the fetters of contemporary life, and reanimate our primordial connection to the natural world offers an apt opportunity to explore these issues. It therefore gives me great pleasure to introduce Edin Koo. Uh, Edin is a poet, writer, translator, and journalist. He is senior fellow at the Institute of Strategic and International Studies, ISIS Malaysia. He is also the founder of Pusaka, one of the region's leading cultural centers, and has worked intimately with masters of the ritual and traditional arts researching aspects of oral transmission, cultural and religious politics, and aspects of ritual and traditional theatre. He is a regular contributor of comment, journalism and literature to leading news and arts platforms around the world. And Edwin will present today, and we're very grateful to him, uh, a lecture on Ulysses as a novel of the tropics. I understand, and full disclaimer, I haven't yet heard it myself, looking forward to it, that Edwin's lecture will be a personal, unconventional, and provocative perspective on the wild, untrammeled, and free literary sensibility of Joyce's language in Ulysses. And the lecture will also consider the indelible influence of non-Western art and aesthetics on modernism and the resonance of Joyce's Ulysses with readers and writers of the tropics, particularly Southeast Asia. So again, thank you very much, and without further ado, over to you, Edwin. Um, I have a little clip of a recording that uh, I'd like to 
play as an introduction to UBC. We stole from the net. Uh, 
here's a small list of them. Um, Bob Dylan, uh, Pink Floyd, uh, Bill Evans, uh, Keith Jarrett, Jack Kerouac, Alan Ginsberg, and James Joyce, among other things. Um, James Joyce is everywhere, and I don't mean that in the kind of formal celebrations that are being done uh, to commemorate the hundred year, as important as they as they are. But we need no further affirmation that James Joyce is everywhere than what happened here yesterday. For close to 25 years, uh, a man who was once a high-rise, high-rising politician uh, was uh, sacked from public office as deputy prime minister, accused of sodomy among many other things, uh, and thrown in jail at various periods on that charge, not any other charge, uh, and uh, beaten on his first day of incarceration. And uh, in the wonderful maelstrom of Malaysian politics, uh, where friends become enemies and enemies then become real enemies, and then real enemies become good friends, and good friends become comrades only to become enemies again, uh, a day in the life, a day in the life. Uh, and as I was driving up with uh, Novelin, uh, we received the news that Anwar Ibrahim was made the 10th Prime Minister of Malaysia, succeeding the man he was supposed to succeed in the first place, uh, who became Prime Minister the second time around. Um, but coincidentally on the radio, uh, the song came on uh, from the Beatles, A Day in the Life, which of course begins with, I read the news today, oh boy. <laughs> Uh, and the illusion of a day in the life uh, from the two singer-songwriters, one of whom at least has Irish ancestry, is of course the book Ulysses, which um, I heard somewhere, I heard this apocryphal, was apparently supposed to be subtitled A Day in the Life of Leopold Bloom. Um, but that was where uh, Lennon McCartney culled the idea for A Day in the Life. Less McCartney, more than I think, for that song at least. How do you know who, who wrote the Beatles songs? Whoever sang them. But I think I was invited to give this lecture, um, given its theme, because of my firm and abiding faith in the idea of wildness. Uh, we are at a festival whose purpose, uh, if that word is anything to go by, is to be festive and to entertain. I believe there's going to be a written lecture, a, a, a written, uh, written um, part of this uh, lecture. Um, but my purpose here is really not to give a lecture, it's just to entertain. Uh, kind of like Ken Dodd before, uh, yeah, it's an opening act standing on one foot or something, talking about Ulysses. Uh, but to be entertained is an experience greatly underestimated, I think, and underappreciated in our time. Because of all the things that Joyce said Ulysses was, a pun, a riddle, he mostly emphasized the fact that it was an entertainment. Um, I refrain from the word lecture again because uh, I'm quite inspired by one of Joyce's greatest readers. Uh, they were both mutually blind, sightless, uh, and given their genius, I wonder uh, what, what comes with with sightlessness. Um, but inspired by Bohez, um, who in his gentle, elusive way, so beautifully encapsulated the experience of reading, rather than the critical experience of a work of literature. I have dipped into books of aesthetics, he said in a lecture at Harvard. But I always had an un uncomfortable feeling reading them that I was reading the work of astronomers who had never looked at the stars. Uh, those who know me uh, at all would know that my great dream is to be a walking book, a lexicon of words from books by the dead. Uh, in another life, I think I believe I made books from human skin, uh, anthropodom anthropodom anthropodomic bibliology, I think it's called. 
And so I'm just heavily tattooed everywhere with words. And somewhere in my body, in a place I cannot reveal here, lah, <laughs> in a part near my right rib, actually, to be precise, are lines that encapsulate the entire experience of Ulysses for me. She would follow a dream of love, the dictates of a heart that told her he was her all in all. The only man in all the world for her, for love was the master guide. Come what, come what might, she would be wild, untrammeled, free. I was rubbish at mathematics, and there's a lot of mathematics in Ulysses. Uh, and one just needs to look at the figures and maps and schemata uh, that Joyce assembled to, to, to actually write this book. Um, but I had a Joycean maths teacher, uh, maths tutor, actually. His name was Mr. Ramalingam, and he came from Jaffna in Sri Lanka. A Joycean character in the sense that he was very jocular, very round, didn't mind that I smoked before his class and it stank his entire house. And he was an ardent supporter and fundraiser for the Liberation Tigers of Tamil Gila. And as he tried to impress on me the logic of longitudes and latitudes, he would go discursive and tell stories about his life and talk about books he liked, and of course talk about the cause of um, General Prabhakar. Uh, and then he would say, okay, let us do this problem the wrong way around. Uh, very recently, I fell into a kind of, I fell very deeply into a kind of despondent trauma. I feared I was experiencing the creeping of early dementia. Uh, because in what seemed a perfectly normal conversation about daily routines and duties, I turned to Pauline, who has been with me for 22 years, and very delicately called her Ma. Ma, as you know, is everywhere in Ulysses. Uh, so I can't say if it, if, if it was a bit of imbecility or if it was Joyce kind of, you know, stirring himself uh, in me. Uh, terrified of that prospect, I set out that most daunting of tasks, which I'm still kind of, uh, you know, committed to and doing every day. Uh, I set out to memorize in the spirit of James Joyce the entire book Finnegan's Week. River Run past Eve and Adams, from swerve of shore to bend of bay, brings us by a commodious vicus of recirculation back to Old Castle and environs. I be actually began my life with Joyce, yes, the wrong way around. In my college library in Kuala Lumpur, by the Kuala Lumpur River, uh, the muddy estuary, which is the color of my skin, uh, I was designated to read Jane Austen's Mansfield Park. But uh, uh, throughout that ordeal, I was never told, for example, as I learned later uh, from Edward Said, uh, that uh, you know, Mansfield Park disguised the character of Thomas Bertram's plantation interests in the Caribbean. Instead, I was asked about meaning, always meaning. What does the writer want to convey? Um, I was not a good literature student. I preferred to sing. And I looked like John Lennon in those days. Uh, so I was a very good flirt. Uh, so I spent a lot of my time uh, outside of the classroom uh, and in the library where at the corner uh, near the air conditioning you could fall asleep. And where the books that were cast uh, in, 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 the, in the category of the never read were kept. Uh, I got two books that obsessed me at that time. Sons and Lovers by D.H. Lawrence, a writer I still absolutely adore. And this strange thing called Finnegan's Wake. Finnegan's Wake was the less read one I knew because it was a very musty volume. It was very thick, very yellow, and it was very smelly. Uh, but I picked it up all the same and uh, finished it. And I began the habit of reading Finnegan's Wake, I think, as it should be read, which is allowed uh, to myself. Uh, and among the 70 words from different languages that Joyce picked up for Finnegan's Wake, 
on trains, at corner stops, you know, wherever he traveled, was a wonderful Malay word. The Malay word is wah, wah, fruits, or in typical Malay parlance, testicles. <laughs> um, that uh, was, uh, I think, the, the thing that really made me dig into uh, this notion of, of sound, uh, this notion of senseless words uh, that have tremendous effect on the senses. I came to learn that a lot later, and I'll speak about it, of course, when I ventured into that incredible world of ritual theatre. Uh, I later, um, I, I don't know if I matured into, or I, I kind of became a little juvenile into, uh, reading Ulysses for the very first time uh, at a bookstore where I was studying in Newcastle upon time, uh, that great Jerusalem of the north, of the northeast, um, and where I stole my first copy of Ulysses. In 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 in, in those days, uh, stealing from bookshops was very easy because they had no uh, they had no barriers with uh, beepers and you just have a guard whom you could befriend who just check your bag. Uh, and I, I learned from um, the Islamic tradition that stealing a book is not a crime. Uh, although now, with my massive library, I have imposed strict Islamic law in my house. So if you borrow my book, I will chop your hand off. Um, but I first read and stole uh, Ulysses at the Waterstones uh, in George Street uh, in Newcastle uh, upon time. Uh, it intrigued me. I think it intrigued me less uh, than Finnegan's Wake did. It certainly enthralled me less than Finnegan's Wake uh, did, but it had something uh, in its prosody and its prose that was um, uh, extremely, extremely irresistible. And I think that thing was something I learned to come to appreciate a lot in all the work that I do and in what I write uh, in the music that I listen to. Um, years later, I read an interview with the great jazz pianist Bill Evans, whom I mentioned again here. Uh, and Bill Evans said, he was asked, where do you learn your sense of architecture and pace? And Bill Evans replied, I read Ulysses. Um, and you dug some more and dug some more. Uh, it's, it's, I had planned to speak to an audience of maybe about 10 people. Uh, the amount of copies that Ulysses first sold, I think, when it was first published by Shakespeare and Co. Before, of course, uh, Great Britain and uh, the US did the greatest favor it could to the book and ban it. Uh, it was, uh, the ban was lifted uh, a couple of years uh, later. Uh, and there's a famous uh, um, judgment on, on the lifting of the ban uh, by John Wolsey, uh, one of the famous. Uh, Judges, or his uh, judgment has become famous. That right, I hope that Ulysses is a sincere and honest book, and I think that the criticisms of it are entirely disposed by its rational, uh, its rationale. Uh, but that lifting of the ban, the words that lifted the ban, were certainly less appealing to me, less interesting to me, less captivating to me, and less enchanting to me than the words of those who banned it. And the banning described the book as the obscenity of Rabelais is innocent compared to this leprous and scabrous horror. Uh, that, that immediately, of course, drew me uh, to it. Uh, again, the act of banning, uh, as we have come to know here in Malaysia, uh, is one of the very great ways of pulling a good crowd uh, towards something and making it really quite uh, legendary. And then there was, of course, an interview I read with Sylvia Beach um, that legendary figure uh, who encapsulated so much of Bohemian life in, in Paris, uh, who recalled uh, American writers coming in great droves to Paris, among them Ernest Hemingway, uh, whom I liked very much then. I think I've outgrown him a little, uh, but uh, I liked very much then, so of course you emulate. Uh, and I loved uh, how she described why American writers came uh, to Paris. Uh, and it was an inimitable combination of looking for whiskey during period of pro uh, uh, prohibition uh, and uh, Ulysses and also a recollection uh, that uh, Joyce 
and this was very impactful for someone who had great dreams and no effort at all at wanting to become a writer then. But apparently, only women wanted to publish James Joyce. There is a ritual tradition in the northeast of Malaysia, um, the Mecca, uh, where the, the northeast has a great pool, something in the astrological uh, star for me, anyway. So it was Newcastle upon Tyne, the Jerusalem of the North, East, uh, and in Malaysia, it's a state called Kelantan, uh, which is the Mecca of the Malay Peninsula in its northeast. There is a tradition, a very vibrant, uh, very demotic, uh, very wild tradition called the Main Putri. And the Main Putri, very loosely translated, is the play of the princess. Um, and there's a particular line in the Main Putri that has a particular kind of relevance uh, and resonance uh, to Ulysses. The line goes like this. Itu yang tidak dikenali namanya. Don't dicari namanya. That which we do not know the name of. We must begin the search for the name we need to know. In many kind of extraordinary ways, and Malaysia is a, you know, a land full of mongrel and polyglot uh, kind of encounters. When I first returned and I was, uh, um, became a journalist, uh, I became one of the very first fully full-time cultural journalists. Uh, and it was a very, really boring and dead job. Uh, there's nothing more painful than watching bad theatre. Uh, and there was a lot of it in Kuala Lumpur. Um, but again, the act of banning uh, did something uh, wonderful for me. Uh, in 1992, uh, the Islamic party-led state government of the state of Kelantan uh, resolved to ban, to ban, proscribe, all forms of ritual and traditional theatre. Uh, what basically encapsulated the spirit in, 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 the, in the Malay, uh, a, a very, a very kind of uh, important and foundational uh, idea, the notion of spirit, uh, to uh, the notion of man and woman. Um, so for reasons of spirit, for reasons of language, uh, for reasons of gender, uh, proscription was imposed uh, because it, it, it diverted from, from uh, uh, strict Islamic law. And everything that had been held close uh, to communities and shaped and made their worldview, language, poetry, uh, diction, uh, was now cast into the realm of the proscribed and of the heretical. Um, as I ventured out of of Kuala Lumpur uh, into this world, um, you found yourself um, quite lost and clueless uh, and quite unable to understand uh, what you were experiencing what you were looking at, especially when you wanted to go beyond uh, the common feature of the, of the, of the report. I uh, discovered uh, a very interesting method of trying to make sense of what I was experiencing by digging deep uh, and making sense and uh, making sense of everything mongrel beneath and putting it all together. Uh, and in the realm of Poetics, in the realm of ritual language, uh, in the rest, uh, in the in the realm of speech patterns, in the realm of aesthetic language that had its own esoteric appeal. James Joyce was indispensable uh, to me. Um, one of the major aspects, and so much has been talked about, the importance of Ulysses this year, and. Uh, so many words have been used uh, to describe it. Words like revolutionary, 
it seems that everything is revolutionary today without us actually understanding what revolution or what revolution actually means. Um, one of the things that really strikes me about uh, Joyce's structure uh, is the nature of orality. Uh, orality which is so essential uh, to us in the tropics. Um, and the act of passing down, the act of uh, ancestral memory, the act of memorizing, uh, and then the act of delivering, and the act of recalling particular kinds of uh, phrases and poetry, uh, uh, which along with the touch uh, of a healer or a shaman, uh, can revive the eternal uh, spirit, I think is a lot of what uh, James Joyce uh, is uh, all about. Um, we know that Ulysses was itself based on myth and a dismemberment of myth and application of myth and the methods used were very incredibly oral from the Homeric tradition but even more than the Homeric tradition from the ballad tradition uh, um, uh, from the morning tradition uh, of, the, of the island that uh, he in many ways came to know uh, but incantation, myth, subversion of language, a sense of a sense of the senseless um, permeates uh, the book throughout. Uh, there is plot, of course, there are characters, of course, but then there is what they say to each other uh, and the way they say it and how they say it. Um, it's interesting to remark also that in one of his letters, to many other, uh, several people, uh, he wrote uh, so much and frequently spoke of the idea of the Ulysses as being written very much for the common man, uh, yet encapsulated in the idea of the common man uh, is everything from Shakespeare to Homeric tradition uh, uh, to, uh, um, uh, you know, to, to the entire philosophical uh, worldview of the Celts. Um, but in all that encapsulation, then, the delivery to the speech patterns uh, and the obsessions uh, and the, and the uh, routine of, of daily life, giving, it, giving daily life really a kind of magical uh, sadness, uh, way before magical realism. Uh, a magical realism, too, I think, has learned so much uh, from Joyce. And you, 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 you just need to fall back on Marquez, uh, who talks about how Joyce animated uh, all the various realist writers that he that, that he loved uh, and um, and studied. And uh, as you think of the patterns in uh, Ulysses, and then you compare them uh, to the kinds of highly ritualized, stylized, a senseless language that you find in a lot of therapeutic and healing theatre, uh, or not senseless, but it, you know senseless in its own sense, it encapsulates a certain kind of, of, of energy. Um, you get a sense, of course, of the importance of music and musicality uh, to the writing of a book uh, and to the setting down uh, of a series of, 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 of prose. You think, of, of course, always of Walter Pater's great uh, kind of quote, quote or, or encapsulation uh, of what art is, all art aspires to the condition of music. Um, <coughs> puns, riddles, mystification, um, so much of what faithfulness uh, is what Joyce himself confessed this book would to be. Uh, and to once again subvert hierarchical uh, structures and approaches to, to, to writing and literature. I've put in so many enigmas and puzzles that it will keep the professors busy for centuries arguing over what I meant. And that is the only way of ensuring one's immortality. Um, you hear resonances of that uh, in everybody who encapsulates and demonstrates mischief uh, and playfulness and subversion and real revolutionary, real um, revolution. 
I remember Bob Dylan, of course, who is a very much a younger incarnation, or aspires to be uh, a Joyce, was once asked in an interview uh, in London, you know, um, what is it like to be a revolutionary songwriter? I'm just a song and dance man, was his reply. So, um, when we talk of Ulysses as a tropic, uh, a novel of the tropics, uh, yes, I confess it's slightly a conceit, uh, it's slightly a trick, um, but uh, it's the historical coincidences and the historical destinies uh, are just too uh, obvious uh, to ignore. Uh, though there has been so much uh, of the ignoring of these uh, coincidences and incidents, incidents uh, and paradoxes uh, that affect, uh, that has affected us and the making of Ulysses in an indirect way. It's such a paradox um, that when you think of the birth of modernism and you relate it to very foundational figures in modernism with Freud, of course, starting with Freud, uh, and we know that Freud gathered so much of his ideas of the subconscious from landscapes like ours, the notion of the subconscious, you know, um, the hierarchy, archetypes, emotional archetypes, uh, they were all there in something like the mind Buddha, in shadow plays, ritual shadow plays. Uh, they continue to be there, and they continue to express the language uh, of this. Um, we go back to the Paris Expo at the turn of the 20th century, that essentially redefined so much of Western art and Western aesthetics. Think of Picasso and African masks. Think of Debussy uh, and Ravel, who changed the entire course of their musicality from an, a linear, linear tradition uh, to a cyclical one upon hearing the sounds of the Javanese gamelan, a tradition that has continued uh, till today uh, with Philip Glass. Uh, you see and you hear these cyclical, um, uh, cyclical uh, sounds all the time in a book like Ulysses. You certainly hear them a lot uh, in, in, in Finnegan's way. You think of Kodan and his uh, uh, marvelous paintings of the Cambodian dancers. Um, I'm less uh, into this idea of appropriation, especially for that time. Uh, I think it needs to be understood a lot better uh, rather than, than get into the hysteria of, uh, of uh, the great uh, complex complex of offenses that is being played up uh, today. Uh, on the obverse side, the word amok, uh, which began to gain such a sense of ubiquity in the English language uh, and many European languages. And something that is very familiar and close to us here in uh, Malaysia because Amok, of course, is a uh, Malay word. Um, and the German, great German writer Stefan Zweig uh, wrote a really moving, wonderful, and kind of terrorizing novel called Amok. Um, a novel that is much better than his biography of, uh, wretched biography of uh, Ferdinand Magellan. Uh, that, uh, you know, whose who's, uh, certain navigation of the globe we commemorated this year or last year, I can't remember. Yeah. Uh, the French, uh, who took on something called the Rubber Plantation Novel. Uh, in 1931, uh, Henri Fauconnier uh, wrote uh, the novel that won the Guinness Prize, the Prix de Prix, 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 in 1931, called The Soul of Malaya. A novel set in the brooding darkness uh, of, of, of the rubber plantations of Malaya, which ended up with a case of Amok uh, and uh, uh, the plantation workers uh, killing the French uh, uh, master uh, owner. Um, so, to reduce the tropics nearly to heat and wetness, uh, I think kind of disrupts uh, our entire history of conjunctions and disjunctions. Uh, I played Miss Gibbon uh, early, it wasn't played very well, uh, but uh, you kind of get a sense that uh, 
the coincidence of a world seriously opening up uh, to itself uh, was happening in that period. Uh, and so the resonances between Joyce and many of the experiences here uh, are too important to ignore. Um, and we're not even talking solely about the form uh, of, of, of Ulysses and Finnegan's Creek, uh, which have so many resonances uh, over here. Uh, yes, to reduce the tropics uh, to just heat uh, and fauna uh, is uh, a lot like reducing Alfred Wallace you know, to his first experience of the tropics, which was tasting the durian. Um, another very uh, Joycean incarnation uh, is the German filmmaker Werner Herzog. Uh, and I don't know, I think many of you may have seen Vince Carallo. Uh, that marvelous film of the tropics, uh, where a lunatic uh, German opera impresario is trying to bring Wagner to the jungles of Peru. And among the many things he has to do is to haul a huge, uh, um, large, uh, it's, it's not a ship, what's it, what's it called? What are those? A large barge, I think, a barge uh, across a mountain. Um, the true story of the film, of course, is that so many people died. Uh, the barge was several times severed from its 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 rope. Uh, I think there was an incident uh, where the cameraman was built by a, was bitten by a poisonous snake, and they had to saw off his leg uh, because the hospital was three days away, uh, which they did in the name of of art. Also very Joycean thing to do. Um, but the idea of this kind of, of energy and pace uh, and danger uh, of the tropics, uh, which you get immediately upon the reading of Joyce, um, is very well encapsulated uh, in a great quote by Herzog, uh, who also refers on many occasions in many of his films to the influence of James Joyce. Here he speaks of the jungle or the tropics. And it's interesting because he comes from Bavaria in a very wooded, in the forests of Bavaria. And uh, this has always been my, I think, the great separating factor uh, between the East and West for me. Uh, because the East is always jungle, messy, chaotic, at any given spot, about 3,000 different things are living, and the great order and structure and symmetry of the Bavarian forests. Uh, but this is what um, Herzog says of the tropics. Taking a close look at what's around us, there is still some sort of harmony. It is the harmony of overwhelming and collective murder. And we, in comparison to the articulate vileness and baseness and obscenity of all this jungle, we, in comparison to that enormous articulation, we only sound and look like badly pronounced and half-finished sentences out of a stupid suburban novel, a cheap novel. We have to become humble in front of this overwhelming misery and overwhelming fornication overwhelming growth, and overwhelming lack of order. Even the stars up here in the, in the sky, they look like a mess. There is no harmony in the universe. We have to get acquainted to this idea that there is no real harmony as we have conceived it. But when I say this, I say this all full of admiration for the jungle. It is not that I hate it, I love it. I love it very much but I love it against my better judgment. All the while I was kind of researching this, this, this performance, this entertainment, trying to be uh, critical, like an astronomer who has never looked at the stars. Uh, there was one thing I came across time and time again that was stated in introductions and lectures. It was about how difficult um, Ulysses was and how everybody gave it up. But 
that's to love a book because of the book, because of a book is one thing. To love the book against your better judgment, that's a whole other experience together. Ulysses then as a tropical novel. Um, one of the great paradoxes, of course, as Europe was entering this, this, this realm of, of uh, the subconscious, uh, of the dark, of the enveloping, uh, of the haunting. Um, think of Conrad, Joseph Conrad, who began his career as a novelist, of course, right here in Malaya, with a book called Alameda's Folly, uh, and then moved uh, eastward towards Borneo, also part of Malaysia, uh, where he wrote a book called Lord Jim, uh, based on, on, on Raja Brook in, in, in Sarawak, before, of course, he committed himself. He, he practiced all of this stuff to commit himself uh, to that great exploration of the deepest part of our, our, our human space. Uh, and that began that Conradian journey down the Congo uh, into what must be one of the most genius books ever in so pity. Uh, called Half Darkness. I'm talking about that as another enthusiasm. Don't you think Marlon Brando was fantastic? Uh, don't you think he was just fantastic? Especially when he wiped the sweat off his, off his bald head. Uh, uh, the topics again for you. Um, but one of the great ironies was, of course, as Europe was entering these spaces, uh, so long our lived experience. Uh, so, the first urgings of anti-colonialism began by adopting the Western structure and Western model. In Southeast Asia, of course, that was, that was uh, expressed in the form of a novel uh, by a towering revolutionary by the name of Jose Rizal. Uh, but Rizal, of course, uh, serialized his novels as they did in the great Spanish tradition, uh, and uh, he very much embarked on taking that uh, model. And if you read so much of Southeast Asian literature, the realist novel uh, is such an important expression um, of, of the time, the struggle, uh, and the state of being of most people at the time. Uh, and if you open uh, the first pages, one of the first pages of one of the great Southeast Asian novels that have ever been written, called Bumi Manusia, or this earth of mankind, uh, you get that confession from Pramodya Ananda At the beginning, all is imitation. So, in conclusion, this hundred years, uh, which you make so much about, um, and in my rereading of Joyce again, I left, I left Joyce uh, a long time ago. And I came back now uh, because of my uh, lapse, dementia lapse, uh, among other things, but also to prepare for this. And uh, I've kind of like swathed myself um, in just about everything Joyce uh, this year, the lectures, the commemorations, the films, the talks, I'm talking about Joyce, I'm talking about Joyce, um, uh, in pretty much all the same way. Um, but why is James Joyce crucial today? Uh, because of the primordiality, because of the wildness. Uh, we live today, and because of words, words that sometimes need not mean anything, uh, but words that fall upon our senses, uh, as the great shamans of Flantan remind us, uh, to stir the spirit. Uh, and to begin a confluence of all the senses. Sound does that. Sound, nothing else. Um, and words also against, I think, what is a very dangerous uh, industry of identities uh, that is being constructed uh, today. And the contemporary kind of metaphor metaphorical burning of books uh, that will cast aside um, the comrade that I've just been enthusing about. Um, and it's Joyce's then very important for me because we go back to this. And remember a lot of these words 
uh, a lot of this industry of identities is apparently being spoken in my name and in my color. Um, so all of this has left us kind of scavengers uh, for such words as rapture. Rapture that is crucial to the idea of trance states, for example. Um, the word ecstasy, uh, which is confined to that of the drug and little else these days. Uh, the word spirit. All these words of tropical ritual theater now cast, uh, first of all, put aside in abeyance in our everyday lives, but in countries like ours, cast to the margins as heresy uh, and uh, the proscribed. Um, I should perhaps pay a bit of tribute to uh, Habib Tango, if he's, you know, he's here. But he's got a, a beautiful uh, kind of encapsulation of this. You force them out, words, anywhere, writing on whatever, no particular ritual, ineffective for a long time now. It works best when you flip through a book and a word catches your eye, your ear, you gleam. The silent world and the voluble world order you to speak. They dictate their laws, their voices. What does this mean? Habib Tengo, who's here? Ulysses has inspired so many reincarnations. Uh, and in all the years now that I've been um, involved in working with, uh, with, with com lots of complexities, uh, I've begun to discover that our language is becoming increasingly limited and limited and limited. Pluralism. What an ugly, bloody word. Multiculturalism. What a painful word. No wonder V.S. Nagol, that old Kamajin I know, but I love him and I love his writing and I love his grumpiness. When he heard the word multiculturalism, shook his fists and said, what barbarism. Um, what is beginning to pull me a great deal more is the idea of the bastard, of bastardy, of giving bastardy a kind of contemporary dignity the bastardy that I find in myself, a mixed race child. Uh, a bastardy I find in the theater that I work in, that is considered so dangerous um, to our normal state today, and the bastardy that I find in Ulysses, which I will assert again, I think is a lesser achievement than Finnegan's will. But the reincarnations, Bill Evans, Werner Herzog. You want to talk about how long Ulysses has lived? You look in all these places. But a whole book of that magnitude and that uh, uh, that kind of uh, sway uh, can still be encapsulated in just a few single lines. Uh, lines of praise, I think, but lines also of empathy. And maybe lines that stem from a camaraderie between two blind people or, or people going into sightlessness. This is from, this is simply called James Joyce, uh, written by Jorge Luis Gohez. In a man's single day are all the days of time from that unimaginable first day when a terrible God marked out the days and agonies to that other when the ubiquitous flow of earthly time goes back to its source, eternity, and flickers out in the present, the past, and the future. What now belongs to me? Between dawn and dark lies the history of the world. From the vault of night, I see at my feet the wanderings of the Jew. Carthage put to the sword, heaven and hell, Grant me, O oh Lord, the courage and the joy to ascend to the summit of the
this day. Nabokov drew that. Um, he taught, he lectured on Ulysses. Uh, and uh, again, being his subversive, grumpy self, uh, he said, there's nothing to lecture about Ulysses. It can all be encapsulated in a drawing. And that's the drawing. But surely, that is not Dublin. That is Kuala Lumpur. That is Kuala Lumpur uh, as I have navigated it uh, with, among others, uh, James uh, Joyce. Um, our great pain, maybe forever, always has been. But a lot of our great pain today is history. Uh, in this tropical part of the world, a lot of the pain is history. And so, of course, the most famous of the Ulysses lines comes to mind. History is the nightmare from which I am trying to live. And so we, in the hot countries, in the tropics, stirred by the spirit of Ulysses, maybe, and a lot of insomnia, we, in the hot countries, will choose not to sleep. Thank you very much. very much and that was uh, a journey and it had many connections. Uh, you brought in the, the tropics of the imagination. Yeah. Uh, I was, I just focused on many things to say but for me Joyce works when you hear him, you know. When you read him it's tough, then you fall back into the language of difficulty you know, because it's dense. But that's very interesting to me that what appears to be very dense and very difficult when you hear them, the humor comes out, the entertainment comes out. He's cracking a joke all the time, you know, he's pulling, uh, you know, the sheet under your feet or whatever. But I'm just struck by, you know, how do we as writers uh, capture the hearing, you know, and not the reading, you know, because when we get into reading, then, you know, you fall back on all the paraphernalia of lectureship and, you know, academia, which is what we do, we need it, but it just takes away, actually, from the joy of encountering the vibrancy and the, and the mongrelism and the bastardry of language, you know. And I, I, I feel we're still struggling with this, you know, because if you look at all the literary criticism of Joyce, you know, the great works that have done, but it's not for poor to the common man, which is what he was really trying to, he was not being disingenuous, I think, when he was saying that, you know, it was, it was a really, he's, he's not a fake in that sense, he, he, he'd give it to you straight, you know. So I was just wondering if you had any thoughts and also, what are we hearing? Are we hearing English? Or are we hearing Irish? Or are we hearing other languages in that language? Because when I am in Dublin, and I hear, sometimes seem very bad theatre, but the language is beautiful, you know, uh, it makes a difference. It's not Jane Austen, you know? So I was just wondering, on the orality, of yeah. Joyce. Do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I have a lot of, a lot of thoughts that I'm working on, I think. But uh, I love that idea of, because I, I think the sound, what it does, I think the word we're looking for is liberates. Liberates. Uh, and, and so when you, when you speak, for example, you know, I keep drawing it back to, to, to uh, shamanistic or ritual healers because they are in this business of, 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 of speech patterns and creating incantation. And the word that is always used for what do the words actually do? The word that they use is, you know, Mande Baskan, uh, liberate, free you, free you. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, you know, another thing with is I think we have greatly, greatly as a result of the other great commodity, yoga classes and wellness and whatever bullshit, you know. Uh, I think we've greatly kind of, um, 
uh, underplay and choose to ignore the importance of the esoteric uh, and the exotic uh, words that I think still have great resonance. Uh, and there's an exoticism that happens in a trance healing session, for example. And there's an uh, there's a there's there's an esoteric nature for, to Joyce's language that is being lost with uh, greater um, uh, increasingly the, the, the literal. Uh, and you see this when you work with uh, ritual performers, because the younger ones who go to school are just uh, not as good, and they're not as you know. Uh, sprightly and they're not as improvisatory and they're not, uh, they, their senses are not as connecting as much. Uh, because the process then becomes, I don't want to use big terms like neurology and whatever not, but, but somewhere in the brain, you know, you're always just trying to understand uh, in the act of memorizing, you're trying to understand rather than, you know, allow it to permeate. Bilal asks very difficult questions. <laughs> no, Erin, I just want to thank you. This was exhilarating, really, and what a journey. I think it's so many extraordinary connections. Uh, I think, yeah, I, I sat here with a big smile on my face and, you know, just, just watching and being on this rock with you was quite extraordinary. So thank you very much um, for this. But I just want you to dwell a little bit on this. And I think that, you know, I think the other thing that, that, uh, that I want to thank you is to liberate uh, joys and language and the idea of literature from uh, meaning, you know, I think that and, and you know, just kind of forcing us to think beyond uh, meaning that kind of hems in our understanding of what literature ought to be. Um, and I think that just simply moving a little bit further in that direction, if you could perhaps tell us a little bit or just dwell on it. Um, this idea of healing, you know, and literature as perhaps healing, and I think that uh, you gestured in that direction that that you know it's uh, it frees us. Uh, you know, words and language are supposed to release a kind of an energy that frees us uh, and kind of or heals us or heals something in us. Uh, just just a little more, perhaps, in that direction would be very nice. Yeah, uh, you know, um, you know, a lot, a lot is being written now about reading. Uh, about how people read and the pleasures they get from reading, and you know, uh, and uh, uh, I'm always very bored because why is reading so nice? Uh, reading is not a nice experience. It's never been a nice experience for me. It's been a healing experience, but healing is not nice. Uh, it's, it really can be quite traumatic, uh, and of course, healing comes from a process of trauma. If you are not traumatized, why are you be, why are you being healed? Um, so, you know, a, a lot of what I think goes into rigor, um, uh, the rigor of, of, of going through a work of literature. Uh, in many ways we've become, the word is not lazy, the word is kind of placid. We, we're really kind of placid about everything. Um, so, uh, for me, uh, this act of healing and, and, and literature definitely contributes to it. Uh, but um, sorry to say that, you know, but a lot of books today are, are really kind of, you know, come with a lot of pain but no healing. Um, uh, Joyce is a lot of pain but there's a lot of healing. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's I think, I, I, I suppose also there is one aspect of literature where words are just not so important anymore. Yeah, words are just not so important anymore. Uh, because uh, these days, or, you know, I always like this analogy of Picasso when he um, when he uh, uh, finished the painting, he would ask about four or five friends to come over, and uh, he would unveil the painting and keep quiet, and then he would ask them after a while what they thought of it. Today, you will go to an assemblage of garbage. And uh, the artist will spend one and a half hours telling you what it is, <laughs> right? Uh, when actually you have no experience with it at all, nor do you want it. Uh, so a lot of our books are like that these days. Uh, but um, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm very intimately involved in this process of language and healing. 
so I do think books have that incredible capacity. Uh, and I think important things in, in tropical countries, of course, when I say the word tropics, I also mean all the politics that, said, that has come. Uh, there is something of great power in Indonesians reading the band Pramodya Anantato uh, with torchlights under their blankets uh, rather than have the privilege uh, of it. Uh, and uh, there is a lot of coming to literature like this that was not in my syllabus uh, that, that, that gives it so much more resonance uh, and, uh, and gut. And gut. Uh, but yes, uh, those are very big, very big questions. Uh, I think we are uh, and, and, and this cent centenary year of, I think those big questions need to be seriously uh, addressed. Uh, I'm deeply concerned about the cultural industry uh, that is being established everywhere. And I see the commodification of our hurt and pain uh, that uh, tells us what we can and cannot read. Uh, believe me, uh, there has been so much uh, from what apparently I shouldn't be reading today that has contributed such a great deal to how I make sense uh, of the work I've done for, for, for 35 years. I learned this above all from an Indian whose name was A.K. Ramanujan. Okay, can we finish? Yes, yes, we actually have no time. We have no time left because the next panel has to start, so please join me in thanking.